Hello everybody today i am going to discuss about built in self strategies in the series of vlsa design course lectures i am vr sishigri rao associate professor in the department of electronics and communication engineering iara so what is bist it is a design for testability technique that places the testing functions physically in the circuit so the basic architecture it contains three hardware blocks to a digital circuit these three hardware blocks are test pattern generator response analyzer and test controller and of course the circuit under test which is called cut the test pattern generator it generates or it produces the test patterns or the test vectors for the cut cut is circuit under test and examples of pattern generators are you can have a rom with the stored patterns or you can also have a counter or you also can have a linear feedback shift register for the test pattern generation so a typical test response analyzer it is uh, nothing but a comparator with stored responses or an lfs are used as a signature analyzer so the comparator what it does it compares the output with a good one or with a golden response and if there is a deviation it produces fail signal so it compacts and analyzes the test responses to determine the functioning or the correctness of the cut so the test control block it is necessary to activate test and to examine the responses or to examine the outputs in general several test functions can be executed through a test controller circuit so test controller circuit it uh, generates a test signal so that this so that the circuit can work in test mode or normal mode now the typical BAST block diagram is like this we have a test controller so this is a test controller which gets the signals test from outside so if the test is signal is active the circuit works in the test mode otherwise the circuit works in the normal mode and you we have a hardware pattern generator which generates the test signals suppose if the inputs are three the hardware pattern generator generates eight different types of signals starting from 00 2 001 010 and all ones so this is the hardware generator and we have a multiplexer here before the cut this is the cud is the actual circuit which is under test and this is a multiplexer so the multiplexer depending upon the test mode either it gives the test signals or the primary inputs to the circuit under test it gets a signal from the test controller and one input is from the hardware generator which generates the test patterns and another signal is our pa pa is nothing but the primary inputs so primary inputs and the output from uh, cut it goes to the output response comparator this is called output response comparator 
which compares the circuit output with the golden response. Golden response is nothing but the reference output, which is good output. So this can be stored in ROM. So the output response analyzer gets the correct reference signal from the ROM and another is the output from the circuit. And then it, it, these two are compared in a comparator. And finally, the comparator gives good or faulty signal. And there is a signal from the test controller to the CUT also. So this is the MUX multiplexer. So when the test signal is active, the test patterns are given to the CUT. Otherwise, the primary inputs are given to the CUT. And these are nothing but the primary outputs which are coming from the circuit render test. So this is in brief about the block diagram of the waste. So mainly it contains the test pattern generator and the test controller and the output response analyzer. So there are four parameters which must be considered for developing the BIST methodology for any system. So these parameters are fault coverage. See BIST is basically to find out whether the circuit or the logic circuit is good or bad. Sometimes the circuit may be having faults, but it, it may not get detected. Suppose, and sometimes the faults are getting detected. Suppose if there are 100 types of faults which are occurring in a circuit, if 90 faults are getting detected by the paste, then we say that the fault coverage is 90%. So this is nothing but the fraction of the faults of interest which can be exposed by the test patterns generated by the hardware pattern generator and that are able to be detected by the output response monitor. So the presence of input bitstream errors, there is a chance that sometimes the computer signature matches with the correct response and in that case the fault will go unnoticed. So fault exists in the circuit but BIST is not able to detect. So that is nothing but fault masking or aliasing. That means BIST is basically designed to find out a fault. Sometimes the fault may get detected. Sometimes the fault may not get detected. If the fault is getting escaped from the BIST, then it is called bad fault coverage or it is also called as masking or aliasing. The next parameter is test set size. So this is the number of uh, test patterns that are produced with a test pattern generator. Suppose if there are a n inputs to the circuit in the test, so how many test patterns are required? 2 to the power n test patterns are required. So that is called the test size. So the test size is the number of test patterns produced by the test generator and it is linked to the fault coverage. Suppose if there are n primary inputs and if the hardware uh, generator is able to produce all 2 to the power n, naturally there is going to be wonderful fault coverage. But instead, if you are using less number of uh, test patterns, naturally that brings down the fault coverage. So a large test set, it implies a high fault coverage. The next parameter is hardware overhead. So what is hardware overhead? Actually what we require is only the circuit and the test. But because it is difficult to test the circuit with external test equipment, we are incorporating BIST into that. So that facilitates the testing or it simplifies the testing or it makes the testing job easy. But at what cost? You are adding area overhead which is called as hardware overhead. The hardware overhead is because of the test circuitry which contains 
the test pattern generator and output response analyzer all that. So the extra overhead which is required for the base is considered as the overhead. So in embedded systems high overhead is not acceptable because uh, you know embedded uh, systems are battery backed. So if you put more and more area naturally it takes more it requires more and more power and what we require is less power consumption. So the area overhead because of inclusion of the base should be as minimum as possible. The next parameter is performance overhead. So this is uh, nothing but the impact of uh, best hardware on normal circuit performance such as the worst case path delays. And overhead of this type is sometimes is important than hardware overhead. Because uh, if you add extra circuitry like multiplexers, naturally there is going to uh, increase the delay, path delay. So that affects the performance. So this is called as the performance overhead. So what are the different issues of a BIST? Area overhead, pin overhead, performance overhead and these things. What is area overhead? Just now we discussed. So additional active overhead area due to the test controller, pattern generator and the response evaluator which compares the circuit output with the reference one and the testing of BIST hardware. So these are all things that contribute to the area overhead. Next is the pin overhead. When you include BIST, at least some additional pins are required, right? So what is the additional pin that is required? Test pin. At least one additional pin is needed to make the BIST into the active mode. And when you incorporate multiplexers, naturally you have to add extra pins because you have to apply extra test signals. So this is also an issue of BIST. Performance overhead just now we discussed because of extra path delays which are added due to BIST because of inclusion of multiplexers etc. So they affect the performance because they are likely to increase the delay. Next is yield loss. They also, it also increases because of the increased chip area. If you add extra circuitry, naturally you are going to add more area. So when the area increases, naturally it affects the yield because any part of the area is likely to be bad or to become bad. So that affects the yield and the reliability. Next is the design effort and time also increases due to design BIST. And the BIST hardware complexity, it increases when the hardware is made testable. So if you want to test the BIST, then naturally it increases the hardware overhead area. So what are the benefits of BIST? These are all the various benefits of BIST because it reduces the testing and maintenance cost because it requires simple and less expensive ATE. If you do not include BIST in the circuit, always the circuit has to be taken to the external ATE. So you have to depend upon the availability of external ATE. We don't know when that is available. So it reduces the testing and the maintenance cost. And BIST also significantly reduces the cost of automatic test generation because you are generating the test patterns either by ROM or by linear feedback shift resistor. So it reduces the cost of automatic test pattern generation. And it reduces the storage and maintenance of the test patterns. And another thing is it can test many units in parallel. If you depend upon external ATA, everything is in serial. But if you include BIST, everything is in concurrent way. Next is, it takes shorter application times and it can test functional system at speed.
and test generator and the response uh, comparator or the response compactor they are implemented they are implemented by simple and counter like circuits like the linear feedback shift registers so the hardware is very simple and what is lfsr lfsr is simply a shift register formed from standard flip flops and with the feedback mechanism in between the paths i am going to show you the sample linear feedback shift register in the next slides so when used as a test generator the lfsr is set to cycle rapidly through a large number of its states and the test patterns are generated easily and the test patterns are generated random and the generated test patterns they, they depend upon the seed that means the initial value so these states whose choice and order they depend upon the design parameters of the lfsr and define the test patterns so the lfsr is a so is a seen as a source of random tests that are in principle applicable to any fault or circuit categories and lfsr is also used in the other side like uh, the comparator which compares the circuit output with the golden response so lfsr is used on the other side of the bist also not only in the input side but on the output side also to compare the circuit output with the golden response there also the lfsr can be used so the lfsr rms final contents after applying the sequence of test responses form a fault signature which can be compared to a known or generated good signature to see if the fault is present so now let us see the lfsr structure so test pattern generators they are constructed from the linear feedback shift registers and uh, you have three types of testing exhaustive testing pseudo random testing and pseudo exhaustive testing so lfsr how it can be used to generate the test patterns i am going to illustrate so i am going uh, here i have the flip flops four flip flops i have so these are the four flip flops and the output of last flip flop is given to here through an exclusive or gate and this output is given here this goes here there is one feedback path here now let us say the initial this is a four stage modulo lfsr a four stage modulo lfsr now let us say the initial value is 001 So what happens because the initial value is zero 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 one. So this one goes here, and in the next thing in the next cycle, I get what I'm going to get. I'm going to get one here, right? And one one will be here, and here this is zero, right? The whole value is zero, and the this value is one. So what I'm going to get here? Here I will get one, and here I will get zero. so the next value is going to be 110 so what is going to be the next value the next value is so this is zero so this zero will come here okay so the next value is going to be zero okay and 
so here I have one here and uh, and this is anyway 0 right because this value is 0 so the next value is going to be 0 1 1 0 so like that if you see you get the, all the random pattern generators so the next value is going to be 0 0 1 1 and next is you will get 1 1 0 1 next you will get 1 0 1 0 so when it is 1 0 1 0 so this 0 will come here right so th this value will be 0 and uh, then you get 0 1 0 1 then triple 1 1 0 then 0 triple 1 1 then 1 1 1 1 so then 1 0 1 1 followed by 1 0 0 1 followed by 1 0 0 0 followed by 0 1 0 0 then 0 0 1 0 followed by see when it is 0 0 1 0 what is going to be the statistic this is here you are having 0 0 1 0 so what is the next value so this, this 0 will come here so you get here 0 and there is a 0 here and this 0 is come here so you will get here 0 so what are you going to get here this anyway you have 0 right so you get 0 and this 1 will remain here 1 so we have started with uh, 0 0 1 and we have ended with all zeros 1. So you can see here that uh, by simple feedback uh, circuits with using flip flops, we are able to generate the test patterns. So this is the basic configuration of LFSR. And what is the formula? This LFSR is it is represented by a polynomial. And what is the characteristic polynomial of this LFSR? See, this is the feedback. We can say that this is x to the power 0, this is x to the power 1, x to the power 2, x to the power 3 and x to the power 4. So this x to the power 4 is coming here. So I can say the characteristic polynomial is x to the power 4 and this is x, right? I have written here x. So x is coming here plus x and this is x to the power 0. So that is always there. So 1 plus. So the characteristic polynomial of this type of uh, LFSR is 1 plus x plus x to the power 4. Polynomial of this LFSR is 1 plus x plus x to the power 4. So you can have another type of LFSR. Here the feedback path is here, right? So when you start with the 0, 0, 1, here you get a different patterns. Next is you get 1 followed by 3 zeros and like that. Now let us go to the response compression or compaction techniques. See, the output of the circuit has to be compared with the golden response. So that means the outputs of pertaining to various input combinations, they have to be stored in a ROM. So if there are uh, n inputs, that means you have to store 2 to the power n outputs. So that is uh, uh, practically impossible. It, is, it requires a large amount of storage space or you require a very big ROM. So instead of that, we go for compression or compaction techniques. So we, redu we reduce we reduce output and store the golden response in different methods. And finally we compare the output with the golden response. So because you are you are compressing the output and you are storing only a signature, it is likely that some of the faults may go unnoticed. That means the output of the circuit Though it is faulty, 
it may match with the golden response and the fault may get unnoticed. But okay, that reduces the fault coverage. But uh, you can save the large amount of storage space. It is not possible to store all the combinations of output in a ROM. So a large amount of data in the CUT, the responses are applied to the response monitor. So if, if you consider a circuit of 200 outputs and if you want to generate 5 million random patterns, then the CUT response to RM also will be 1 billion bits, which is not manageable. So what we do, it is necessary to reduce or to compact this uh, large amount of circuit responses into the manageable size. To what size you want to manage? Suppose uh, minimum uh, size will be either 64 bit, bit, bit or 32 bit. So to that extent we want to do the compression. So the response analyzer it compresses very long test response to a single word. So that word is called as the signature. So this signature is then compared with the pre-stored golden response obtained from faulty responses using the same compression mechanism. So if the signature matches, then the circuit is regarded as faulty. Otherwise, the circuit is considered as faulty. Okay. So there are different uh, response analysis methods like once count, transition count, syndrome count and signature analysis. These are the different methods. So signature analysis. So what we do? The, the compact uh, good machine response uh, to good machine signature. So actual signature generated during testing and it is compared with the good machine signature. And what is aliasing? It is a compression like a function that maps the large input size into small output size. So it is something like many to many or many to one mapping. Because of this errors may occur in the input stream. So a fault response may have a signature that matches to the golden signature and the circuit may get may be reported or may be considered as fault free one. So such a situation is called as aliasing or masking. So that means the faulty circuit is getting escaped from the detection. So though the circuit is faulty, the BIST is giving that it is a good circuit because of aliasing. So this aliasing it is defined as a probability that a fault circuit or a faulty response is regarded as fault free and it is defined like this. Suppose you assume that there are the possible input patterns that are uniformly distributed over the possible mapped signature value. Suppose if there are 2 to the power m input patterns and if there are 2 to the power r signatures, then 2 to the power n minus r input patterns map into a given signature, then the aliasing property it is defined as number of erroneous input signals that map into the golden signature divided by the number of faulty input responses. So that is only but the total. 2 to the power m minus r minus 1 by 2 to the power m minus 1. Mixing just got right, sir. Mixing just got hard. Mixing just got right. No. So this is equal to 1 by 2 to the power r. So the aliasing is a probability which is of major consideration in response analysis. It is a very important parameter because the faulty circuit is escaping the best detection, fault detection by the best. So due to the n to 1 mapping property of the compression, it is unlikely to do diagnosis after compression. So a diagnosis resolution is very poor after compression. So in addition to aliasing probability, hardware overhead 
and hardware compatibility are also the important issues. So the hardware compatibility is, it is referred as how well the best hardware can be incorporated into the CUT or the DFT. DFT is the design for testability. Now ones count. So in ones count, the number of ones which are produced in the circuit output response is counted. So this method, it counts the number of ones as a signature. So how you count the number of ones? It requires only a simple counter to do the job. So this figure, it shows how the ones count can be incorporated. This is a test pattern and this is a circuit and the circuit output is given to a counter and the counter gives how many numbers of ones are present. And this number of ones which are present in the circuit output, it is compared with the golden signature and if there is a match, yes, this says that the circuit is okay. Otherwise, this says that the circuit is faulty. So there is a ones count method. Next is the transition count. So in transition count, it is similar to the ones count technique, but the difference is it counts only the transitions like 0 to 1 or 1 to 0. Okay. What is the difference between ones count? Suppose if the circuit is having 0, 1, 1, 1. So ones count will give that the output is 4. Transition count will give that it is only 1 because 0 to 1 transition only 1. Then later 1, 1, 1. There is no change of value. So it gives a value as 1. So the signature uh, quantity is less. So the number of bits which are required for transition count is lesser. So this is one way the signature can be obtained and can be compared in the BIST. So this is a circuit for the transition count testing. Uh, this is a circuit under test. This is a D flip flop. The circuit uh, output is directly given to the D flip flop. Then after that, we, I, we have an exclusive OR gate. The output of the D flip flop is given to this exclusive OR gate and with the delay and it is compared and the transitions are found out with the present output with the previous output. If there is a difference, exclusive OR gate will give the output as 1. If the present output and the previous output both are same, then there is no transition. Then exclusive OR gate will give the common value as 0. So that is how the signatures are obtained in the transition count testing. The main advantage of LFSR is it can be used as a test pattern generator in the input site or in the input port of this or it can also be used as, as a comparator to compare the circuit output with the golden response on the output port side of the bit. So LFSR. So how that is done? So this is an example. Here, this is a this is LFSR we have. Now, let us say the input bit streams are 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. Let us say. So, what is the output? If it is 1, if 1 is coming here, uh, what is the output? Initially, you say that the, all the output values are 0. Here, 0, 0, 0, 0. Let us say. Then, if 1 is going here, then the the next value will be 1, 0, 0, 0. Because this 1 will come here and this is 0. There is a difference. So you get 1, 0, 0. So you get 1, 0, 0, 0. Now let us say another input is 1. When another, the next input is 1. Then you get 1, 1 with all zeros. And finally, when, you, when this last one in the last one arrives, the output of LFSR is 0, 1, 1, 0. You see, for the input stream of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 bits, the output of LFSR is 4 bits. So you have, you have done the compression. And the last signature is 1, 0, 1, 1. So that is called as the remainder. So this is the output from 
the correct circuit or the fault free circuit suppose if there is a fault in the circuit then this value is going to change and this is the output from another type of fault this is the uh, okay so this if there is a fault then the signature is going to change then you can say that the circuit is faulty okay and in this case actually the, this is example where the input response is faulty but i am getting the golden signature which is matching with the correct one so this is this is an example case of aliasing this is an example case of aliasing now let us discuss about the built in logic block observer that is also called as bilbo so this architecture it applies to circuits that can be positioned into independent modules okay and each module it is assumed to have its own input and output registers and such registers are added to the circuit where it is necessary and the registers are also designed so that the test purposes uh, for test purposes they act as prpg or mi source so this is the basic um, Uh, block diagram of three stage bilbo and there are uh, four modes normal mode when the bits b2 b1 or 1 1 the circuit operates in normal mode okay the normal circuit it works when it is 0 0 then it operates in the scan mode and for 1 0 it works as a mixer test generation and signature analysis and in 0 1 it is in the passive mode and it is also called as the reset mode so this is uh, in brief about the built in self test the main advantages are we are able to reduce the circuit overhead and also it simplifies the testing because we no longer depend upon the external ate and it is uh, it improves the field maintenance and also it improves the yield and the reliability and it makes the testing very simple so with this i conclude today's session on twist thank you like share and subscribe hit the bell icon for more updates